So I'm surrounded by something that actually represents the change that the construction sector has got to go through as we get to this zero carbon economy that we have to get to by mid-century. And this challenge of net zero is one that every sector of the economy is now running towards. But I would say the construction sector is not doing nearly enough. And of course, that is a huge problem. And if you look at the history in construction, it hasn't done enough. So that idea of change is really fundamental to what needs to happen over the course of the next few decades. And that idea that a younger generation in the construction sector, in the architecture sector, is, is really going to take us through this big change to use new materials to really kind of grab the idea that construction and buildings in the built environment are absolutely critical to achieving net zero by mid-century. I was really, really interested in this project as it's like uh, with sustainability and with uh, climate crisis, um, I'm interested in the ways that we understand where we are in a period of history. I think with this, it's very much take a step back because we need to kind of relook at how we're interacting with the landscape and how we're controlling it and how we're managing it. It's not just structures there and people come to see it, but something that they can participate in the growth. <laughs> Young architects will spend the bulk of their careers over the 30 years to 2050 responding to the impacts of the climate crisis. To do this successfully, they'll need new materials, new design strategies and new ways of working. Progress in construction is impeded by its insularity. Working with people who are different to us helps develop co-design skills and to communicate beyond the bubble of architecture. So we brought together a diverse group of young creators from 17 disciplines in the two countries. In Scotland, students of architecture, product design engineering, jewellery, sculpture, photography, film and botany worked with early career architects, landscape architects and engineers. Connecting the creativities of the hand and the brain proved a powerful design tool. I'm not from an architectural or an engineering background. I'm actually a jeweler and a silversmith. The the move from object and sort of handheld scale to s s the scale of somewhere that you would step inside, you know, is a big jump. But the kind of interaction between a person and an object is kind of works in the same way, I guess. The fundamental thing is how do you make something work? The great joy of a project like this is it's it's fundamental kind of structural thinking, and I think here. This idea of using a grid shell to do it introduces a whole really interesting dynamic to the thing because you can create structures that are uh, unusual but at the same time will stand. I actually had sheets of this very thin um, plywood, so mm -hmm. I cut that into strips and I was trying to sort of look at the forms. We chose a brownfield site, reusing foundations from a previous building that store about 14 tonnes of carbon. The challenge was to design a new structure within the constraints of four lines of concrete. The response, a 3D curvilinear lattice, the most different form imaginable. This avoided new concrete, a huge carbon source and the second most used substance by man after water. 8% of global carbon emissions come from cement, more than from aviation. If concrete was a country, it would be the third biggest carbon emitter after China and the USA. As transport transitions away from petrol and electricity from coal, so construction will transition away from cement. Along with biocomposite alternatives, future designers will need the skill to reuse the carbon held in existing structures. One set of foundations may support many buildings over their lifetime. Exploring low-carbon, non-toxic materials with transformative growth potential brought us to timber and mycelium. Larch was joined into 16 metre lengths, fixed with stainless steel cable ties and bolts. Timber uh, technology is really firing forward. You can make things that we couldn't do with bits of trees before, and that's completely fascinating. Pushed to the limit of its strength and bendability, it wasn't clear whether the structure would work until the grid shell was actually constructed. If the timbers hadn't bent sufficiently, the group would have adapted the design on site to reflect the limitations of the material. This was an intentional design risk. Construction is dominated by accepted norms and low-risk approaches adopted for financial reasons, but which impede innovation and market development. To transform construction, we need to change our attitude to change. We need designers that will push materials and lead teams beyond their comfort zones. For this project, it was important that we were daring, 
not to have risked failure would have guaranteed that we didn't succeed. The furniture created from mycelium and agro waste in five days shows how we can grow our future buildings, displacing plastic and metal products. The group fused landscape and building architecture into one process of environmental design. I was interested in how these sorts of interventions, like beavers introduce, help change a landscape and maybe slow down water. We discovered that the post-farming landscape of the local area was part of the original Scottish rainforest, a rare temperate rainforest dominated by oak and hazel, rich in ferns, mosses and lichens. Using a generative approach, the timber grid shell mimics rainforest conditions of shade and shelter, enabling pioneer rainforest plants to develop as an educational resource and a nursery to spread the habitat further afield. By creating conditions that are good for forest plants, the design also makes a place for humans to thrive. Mimicking a forest clearing, the space slows people down, brings attention in close, moderates temperature, creates a more intimate acoustic, all reducing environmental stresses. I quite like the idea that we can weave in elements of wildness and elements of rainforest. I've, I've done some research looking at mosses and things like that as well, and plants that absorb water. Historically, our landscapes tended to be much better at absorbing water because of the way they were managed. And it'd be really nice to sort of to look at some of these plants. We talk about landscape and then we talk about mycelium and then it's kind of a grid chat. And like, obviously the success of this is all of it coming together, right? The building is a temporary installation, but all buildings are temporary, though we rarely design with that in mind. Even the venue for COP26 is predicted to be below water soon. As our fixed infrastructure, buildings and coastal settlements struggle with increasing rainfall and rising sea levels, we need a more flexible and adaptive architecture for the coming century. And in this, our grid shell echoes the architecture of the Scottish travellers, long-time residents of Argyll. Architecture is a creative industry whose mission is to build a better world, so it should be a leading voice in a progressive and just transition. But the tragedy at Grenfell revealed an industry dominated by short-term commercial interests rather than long-term social and environmental ones. This is in part because construction has an overwhelmingly patriarchal culture. It's the least gender equal sector in the UK at 94% male, with 74% of architects men. So it stood out that when we called for creatives interested in working together to tackle climate change, applications were dominated by women at 83%. Research shows that women tend to be better managers and team workers and bring more diverse life experience to design. But the key reason we need a change of leadership from men to women in construction is because women are less vested in the established culture that inhibits progressive change. We found a generation of talented professional women committed to change who now need pathways to power along with the 17% of men. If we are to transform our profession to be fit for the 21st century, there is no doubt the future is female. Though challenged by COVID, the partnership with Ghana gave huge depth to our understanding of design for global climate change. While circumstances for the two countries were different, it became clear that the challenges of climate change and successful design strategies were the same. Both countries face a dangerous increase in rainfall linked to land use, and both solutions involve blended landscape building design and co-creation with communities. It was also clear that climate change exacerbates historic inequalities. The UK has 0.8% of the world human population, but is responsible for 5% of total cumulative emission. That's twice the population of Ghana, but 250 times its emissions. Scotland and Ghana are both Atlantic countries, but Scotland faces 43 centimetres of sea rise by 2100, while Ghana faces 78. Ghana also has fewer financial and human resources to mitigate the effects of climate change, in part the legacy of empire. The UK's wealth is the legacy of 250 years of coal, oil and gas emissions, the power and wealth that built an empire which grew by exploiting the natural and human resources of places like Ghana whose resources were gold and slaves. By using a baseline for zero carbon strategies of 1990 level emissions, these historic global inequalities were perpetuated. That central learning space, I think that's really, really important. This engaging with the community and making sure that, that we're not just kind of coming in as artists and saying, this is what we think we need here. Children are involved in their future and kind of organizing it. We, we have kind of the, the skeletal frame of what we're trying to do. 
or group of young designers may be responsible for constructing a few hundred buildings between now and 2050. Part of what we need to learn as designers and as a society is the skill of knowing how not to build, to live with less stuff, the art of living well by consuming less, so that there's more for others to share who have fewer resources. By making a space for learning, we learn many things. We learn that by recognising our place in nature, we can rediscover what it is to be human. We learned how biomaterials can help us grow our way to a zero carbon future. We learned that diversity brings strength. We learned how trying to achieve something new comes with the risk of failure, but we must still take that risk. And we learned how designers across the world share a common challenge, one that can only be solved together.